Welcome to our webinar, Your Guide to Glaucoma Surgery, What to Expect. My name is Brzez Castellanos and I am the Manager of Outreach and Social Media at Glaucoma Research Foundation. Joining us today is Dr. Mary Q. Dr. Q is a glaucoma and cataract surgeon, as well as an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Chicago. Dr. Q received her medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and completed her ophthalmology residency at the Wilmer Eye Institute at John Hopkins. Lastly, she completed her glaucoma fellowship at the Cole Eye Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. After Dr. Q's presentation, we will be joined by two glaucoma patients for the Q&A portion of the program. First, we have Beata Skonecki. She has a phacic glaucoma and is a glaucoma support group moderator. Secondly, we have Jenny Wright. She participated in our recent patient summit in Long Beach, California, and has asymmetrical glaucoma and is a retired nurse and teacher. Please help me welcome Dr. Mary Q. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the webinar. My name is Mary Q. I'm going to tell you guys what I tell all my patients about glaucoma surgery. Broadly, the eyeball is like a sink and there is a faucet that makes liquid, which is aqueous, and there's a drain that drains the aqueous out. So whenever we're doing surgery to lower the eye pressure, there's basically only three things we can do. We can either make the eye drain aqueous out the normal way, out of the natural pathway. We can make the aqueous drain out a different way or we can turn down the faucet and reduce the amount of aqueous that is made. So first I'm gonna talk about some procedures that help the eye drain aqueous out the natural pathway. There's a big category of glaucoma surgeries called microinvasive or minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries or MIGs. And one of the subcategories within MIGS are procedures that make it easier for the fluid to exit the eye out of the normal drainage pathway, which is called the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. These procedures either put a stent in the natural drain, cut into the natural drain, or dilate and flush the natural drain without cutting it. I tell my patients this is like pouring Drano down the sink that's blocked or rotor rootering the sink that's blocked to try to get it to drain a little bit better. When we do these less invasive procedures, we don't have to open up the outside layer of the eye, which is called the conjunctiva. These minimally invasive procedures are performed directly on the inside of the eye through a very small incision that is one to two and a half millimeters. And this is the same incision that's used for normal cataract surgery, or sometimes it's done without cataract surgery and the incision's even smaller. The idea is that the recovery process after these MIGS procedures, in terms of the drops and how many clinic visits you have to do, are gonna be similar to what you would have to do for just regular cataract surgery. These procedures were first developed to be done at the time of cataract surgery. So it's meant to be sort of simple on the patient and the process is not too complex or complicated. So again, with these procedures, you're either going to flush the drain cut into the drain, or put a stent in the drain. In terms of what you should expect during the surgery, no matter which one of these procedures you're having, it should only take about five to 15 minutes. And if you're combining it with cataract surgery, that time would be in addition to the cataract surgery time. Your eye would be numbed with eye drops, or also a gel, or sometimes extra numbing medicine goes into your eye socket, like when you're at the dentist getting a filling. You would be in the operating room and your anesthesiologist would give you relaxing medication through your IV. Your eye would be cleaned off with a cleaning solution. There would be a drape covering your face and your body and you, a little clip would help you keep your eyes open so you don't have to worry about blinking. And then you would see bright lights, but you definitely won't feel any pain. 
during a lot of these procedures, we ask you to turn your head to the side, like this direction. But you don't have to worry about that. Usually your surgeon would hold your head and help you turn it to the side. After the procedure's over, your eye might be covered with a patch or a clear shield and somebody has to drive you home. If you're having surgery on the only eye that you see out of, we wouldn't patch it shut. But if you have two eyes, sometimes we patch the one eye shut. You might be asked to take eye drops the night of surgery, or you might be asked to take no drops at all and just leave your patch in place until we see you the next morning. After surgery, you have to use an antibiotic and a steroid eye drop, and then slowly those are reduced over about a month. And these are the same eye drops that you would normally use after cataract surgery. There's no additional risks besides um, the ones that are associated with cataract surgery. So a very small risk of bleeding and infection like with any kind of procedure. After these MIGS procedures, sometimes we give you an extra eye drop which makes the pupil smaller and this helps to lower the eye pressure and helps blood clear out of the eye. Some of these procedures bleed a little bit more than others. The ones that cut, for example, and sometimes patients who are on blood thinners may not be recommended these particular procedures. Overall, these procedures are meant to lower your eye pressure a little bit and maybe get you off a drop or two, but long-term, it's hard to know whether this will control your glaucoma adequately. It really depends on your situation. After the surgery, you would be seen one day, one week, and one month after surgery, and then the visits would be spaced out more after that, depending on how your eye heals, and um, you may need more or less doctor's visits depending on the situation. For the recovery process, you would wear a shield when you sleep for the first week or so. You might have extra precautions like no bending, no lifting, no straining if your um, procedure involves cutting or if there's blood in your eye. Some of the um, procedures bleed more than others, and sometimes there's blood in your eye that has to be rinsed out later. This is pretty rare, but it can happen, and it's not a big deal if we have to go back and rinse out some blood. I'm cautious about recommending procedures that involve cutting into the drain or having a high risk of bleeding. Um, if you have activities that you do like lifting heavy weights or doing a lot of yoga upside down, because even after you've recovered, some of these procedures could make it so that you have bleeding into your eye, even in the future. In terms of time off work, it depends on what you do for your job. If you have a computer job or a desk job, there's nothing that says you can't use your eyes to look at a screen, but there are other jobs that require more lifting and straining and then we would recommend that you take a little bit more time off work because you wouldn't wanna be bending or lifting right after the surgery. <clears throat> after the procedure, your eye might feel a little sore. It might feel like there's an eyelash stuck in there. The drops might sting a little bit when you put them in. Your eyes might be a little bit teary. And then after about a month or so, if this was combined with cataract surgery, you would get new glasses. And then your doctor would keep monitoring your glaucoma going forward and hope that it remains stable and that the pressure was low enough and that you um, would get your visual fields checked and you hope that it would not progress. And if it does, then we have bigger surgeries that we can do to help lower the pressure. So the next category of procedures are ones that drain the fluid out of a different way. That's to say that you did Drano down the sink, you rotorooted the sink, but the water is still backing up into your sink. So you have to go to Home Depot and buy new pipes and sort of replumb the, the sink of your eyeball. So on this picture, I circled the procedures that we're talking about now. These are the ones that drain aqueous out of a different pathway. So there's a trabeculectomy, which makes a trap door on the wall of your eye so fluid can drain out and collect in a space under the skin of your eyeball, which is called a blood. There are tube shunts, which plugs a tube into the eye and the fluid collects in a capsule that grows around the end of the tube. And there's also something called a Zen gel stent, which is sort of a mix between the two. It, it's a tube that plugs into the eye, but there's no plate at the end of it. And there's also a micro invasive way to insert the Zen, so that's also listed over there. In all of these cases, the fluid exits the inside of your eyeball and collects in a space outside of your eyeball and then gets absorbed by your body. So for trabeculectomy, there is a little trap door that's made on the side of your eye and there are some stitches that hold the door closed. And after surgery, there might be some extra laser procedures that are needed to cut some of these stitches to open the door a little bit wider. Sometimes the body will grow a lot of scar tissue and this will scar the door shut and then not enough fluid will flow out the door. And so that will make the surgery fail over time. 
but we inject anti-scarring medications at the time of surgery to try to keep this trap door open, try to keep your body from scarring it up too much. So if you've had a successful trabeculectomy, the pressure can stay low for many years. And there's a lot of factors that come into play with how successful the surgery is. It mostly relates to how your body heals and scars after surgery. In terms of what you should expect, this is done in the operating room. It takes a little bit longer than those MIGS procedures, about 30 to 60 minutes. You would again have your IB numbed. You would get extra numbing medication more than with a MIGS procedure. And again, your um, the procedure would be done and then you would go home at the end of the day as an outpatient. Nobody stays in the hospital after um, these types of surgeries usually. You would come back the next day sometimes the next week, sometimes two weeks, three weeks, more frequently than after a mix procedure, depending on the pressure and how open or closed this trap door is. Like I mentioned, there might be extra visits that involve cutting some stitches. After the surgery, you have to use eye drops, but for a little bit longer than after those mix procedures. One of the very important drops is a stairway drop that prevents your body from scarring the door shut too tightly. And you would have to use the drops more frequently than after a mix procedure. And your doctor would let you know whether you need to stop all of your normal glaucoma drops or continue some of them. And these would be adjusted over the course of the many months after surgery. In terms of the recovery process, a trabeculectomy is a little bit more invasive. You might have to wear the shield a little bit longer and you might have more activity restrictions, like a longer period of time where we say no bending, no lifting, no straining, don't rub the eye. You might have to take a little bit more time off work if you do a job that involves a lot of lifting or physical labor. But if you have a desk job, then you can definitely sit at a computer all day and that will not harm your eye. The trabeculectomy does involve making a cut on the surface of your eye or the skin of your eye. And so this can feel more irritating because there's gonna be stitches on the surface. So this feels like the eyelash stuck in your eye sensation and that can persist a little bit longer. With trabeculectomy, there is a risk that the pressure could be too low, and there are some dangers associated with the pressure being too low. So the restrictions in terms of not bending or lifting are to prevent those complications. A tube shunt is very similar to a trabeculectomy in many ways. It lets the fluid drain out of the eye through a little plastic tube, and then it collects under the skin of the eyeball. Some types of tubes have valves in them, and some of them don't have valves, and they work differently. And you should talk to your surgeon about which type of tube they're recommending for you. In terms of the actual surgery itself, the process for you would be very similar. And in terms of the recovery process, the process for you would be similar as well. Some of the tubes have more risk of pressure too low. And so the restrictions may be more strict if your pressure is on the low side. And if your pressure is not too low, then the restrictions ease up a little bit. There is a risk of bleeding with these procedures as well. And so if there's bleeding inside your eye, then there may be extra precautions to help you recover from the bleed. A Zen gel stent is a tube that is even smaller. It's about the size of an eyelash and it connects the inside of your eyeball to the space underneath the conjunctiva. But there's no plastic plate at the end of it. And you do get the anti-scarring medication that we inject at the time of trabeculectomy. The surgery takes much less time than a trab or a tube, and the recovery process is uh, quicker and more comfortable, and the complications may be less severe, but the success rates may also be a little bit lower than a traditional trabeculectomy done the regular way. And it's not really considered a microinvasive procedure if we do it by opening the conjunctiva, though it can also be done in a microinvasive way by going through the cornea. And you should ask your surgeon about which way they typically do it and what they recommend for you. So finally, there's a category of procedures that involve turning down the amount of fluid that is made by the eye. So in the same figure here, underneath MIGS, you can see it says ECP. So this ECP stands for endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, but there's also cyto cytophotocoagulation done without an endoscopic approach. Uh, the CPC just means that we are going to the part of your eye that makes liquid, which is called the ciliary body, and treating it with a laser, which turns down the amount of fluid that it makes. So the ECP is done with an endoscope, and then the other way is done without having to go into the eye. So this is a picture of ECP, endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. The laser probe goes directly in the eye and uses the laser energy to treat the ciliary processes. 
Your surgeon is holding the probe with one hand and then looking at the TV screen, which shows the ciliary processes getting lasered. So this is about as invasive as one of those MIGS procedures. It's a relatively gentle procedure and it can be done in eyes that have relatively good vision because the risks and complications are not as severe as the more heavy duty types of lasers, which I'll mention next. There's a theoretical risk of infection since there is an actual incision on the eye, which is similar to the risk of infection after cataract surgery, which is extremely low. After the procedure, you would get antibiotic eye drops and anti-inflammatory eye drops, and this procedure can cause a little more inflammation than typical cataract surgery. This laser can be done at the same time as cataract surgery or in eyes that have already had cataract surgery before. But we can't do this procedure if the eye does not um, have ne has never had cataract surgery and your normal lens is inside your eye because we wouldn't be able to reach the ciliary processes with the laser if your lens is in the way. There's theoretically a risk of making the pressure too low with this, but the risk of that is much lower than with a trabeculectomy or two. And you shouldn't have very many activity restrictions with this type of laser compared to trabeculectomy or two. So next, the regular type of CPC is transscleral, meaning that we go across your sclera from the outside to the inside without actually cutting it. It's completely non-invasive and it's a way to apply the laser energy to the ciliary body to decrease the amount of fluid getting made. This is usually done in the operating room too, even though we're not actually cutting into the eye because it can be kind of uncomfortable. It sort of hurts when the laser energy is applied. And so in the operating room, we either give you a shot of numbing medication into the eye socket and or we put you to sleep, either light sedation or deeply asleep. This procedure only takes five minutes and there's no incisions, there's no infection. You don't have to use antibiotics afterward. We would not expect any bleeding because there's no tissues getting cut. It does cause some inflammation though, so that can sometimes make the vision blurrier. So we wouldn't wanna do this in an eye that sees extremely well because it can make the vision blurry. We often do this procedure in somebody's worst eye. Like if you have two eyes, we would do this in the worst one. In recent years, there have been more gentle laser settings that allow us to do this procedure even on eyes that see better. In terms of your experience, it's much faster than a trabeculectomy or tube. You would go into the operating room, you would not feel any pain, you would wake up and go home. Your eye might feel a little sore afterward. You may or may not have a shield covering your eye depending on whether or not they injected numbing medication. And if you were sedated, somebody has to drive you home. You can't just go home on your own even though this was not an incisional surgery. After the procedure, you'll use a lot of extra eye drops, similar to what we mentioned with the other surgeries, except there won't be an antibiotic because there's no cuts. And then your surgeon would let you know whether you should continue your glaucoma drops or stop some of your glaucoma drops. And then long-term, we would monitor your pressure to see if things are stable or if things are getting any worse. I usually don't even see patients one day after this laser. I see patients one week later. So because it's so non-incisional, there's not quite so many visits required. And if I'm seeing a patient one week later, then I just give them instructions on what to do with the eye drops the next day. And the patients will just start their own eye drops and I'll see them a week later. So finally, micropulse CPC is a gentler version of the CPC. It is still non-invasive. It's still a laser that goes to the part of the eye that makes liquid and turns it down. This one can be done in eyes with better vision because the laser energy is not as aggressive. Instead of each spot of laser treating one exact point, the laser probe sweeps back and forth and sort of gently treats a broad area of ciliary, ciliary processes. And in general, this is causes less inflammation and uh, would cause less blurry vision. The long-term success rates are also a little unpredictable here. And so sometimes I offer micropulse instead of um, the regular CPC, if it's somebody's only eye with very good vision and the eye has not yet had previous cataract surgery, this would be just like a non-invasive, non very gentle thing that you could try at first if for some reason the patient were not a good candidate for one of the other types of surgeries. I usually like to um, offer surgeries that help the eye drain better first because with glaucoma, the, the problem is the drain. And so it's nice to try to make the eye drain better or make the eye drain a different way rather than turning down the faucet because that doesn't exactly solve the drainage problem. But these turning down the faucet procedures are also very good and have their own advantages too. So it depends on your individual situation. So in conclusion, there are a lot of great surgical options to lower the eye pressure. 
Not all of them are right for every person or every eye. Some of them are less invasive and have an easier recovery. And some of them are a little more invasive and have a more involved recovery process. And the success rates dif are different too, depending on the type of procedure. And at the end of the day, you and your doctor have to figure out together which procedure makes the most sense for you and your specific situation. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you found this to be useful and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Mary, for such a great presentation. And thank you everyone who submitted questions. I would like to start our Q&A session off by thanking our panelists for joining us. Thank you, Ginny and Beata. Beata, can you please start us off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your glaucoma surgery experience? Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is Beata. Um, I was actually born with cataracts, which placed me at increased risk for developing glaucoma. And I was diagnosed with glaucoma when I was nine years old. Um, I began having surgical procedures for it in the left eye only when I was 15. Um, the glaucoma in my left eye has always been much more aggressive for whatever reason. Um, and I had a number of laser procedures. I had micropulse in addition to some other lasers. Most recently, I had an Ahmed clear path shunt placed um, this past March, and that has been my most successful surgery. And I am extremely grateful to my glaucoma specialist that she made that happen. Thank you so much for sharing. Ginny, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey? Yeah, I'm, um, I had, I was diagnosed with um, severe glaucoma in my left eye in the middle, in the fall of 2017. And after I did um, a lot of research and went to many doctors, um, I finally opted to do a trabeculectomy, which is, I know is a more invasive surgery, but um, I, my, my vision in my left eye was so bad, so poor. So, um, we opted for that because that for sure would keep my, um, optical pressure low and, um, it would save the little eyesight that I had left and it was really successful. So happy to hear you experienced great success with that. We did get a lot of questions during the presentation. So we're going to jump right in. Okay, so first we have, are the results of glaucoma surgery permanent or will it need to be repeated? Are there some surgeries that are better than others for a repeated surgery in the same eye? That is a great question. It depends on which procedure. So none of these glaucoma surgeries are ever a guarantee that you will never need more surgery for your entire life. You could imagine if you went to Home Depot and bought new pipes and plugged them into your sink, those pipes could get clogged over time too. So sort of a similar concept, any surgery that you have could fail because the fluid is not flowing out of your eye well enough anymore. And that could happen very early, that could happen years later, that can happen decades later. And so glaucoma is a lifelong disease. And even though you've had the surgery to lower the pressure, you have to be monitored all the time forever because the pressure could go up and you might need more surgery. Some of the surgeries can be repeated in a way, um, like those lasers, for example, you can certainly just do it again. In some surgeries, you can't quite repeat because if you cut the trabecular meshwork, then it's been cut. So you can't really recut it. Um, but some procedures, if you just flush the drain, you could definitely reflush the drain. Like you could pour Drano down the same sink twice. In terms of the bigger surgeries, like a trabeculectomy, sometimes people would do one trabeculectomy and then a second trabeculectomy, or sometimes people will do one trabeculectomy and then a tube. Sometimes people will do one tube and then a second tube. And so sometimes one tube can be exchanged for a second tube. And so there are many revision types of surgeries that can happen if somebody needs another procedure in the future. Um, as glaucoma surgeons, we're always planning ahead. So while we want your first surgery to work and be your only surgery that you have forever, a lot for a lot of people, that's not the case. So we're always planning ahead. Oh, if we have to do more, what's the next step gonna be? So even if they, haven't told you about the plan B, we have it for you written down in, in our chart for you and in our heads. Thank you for that response. Does the type of glaucoma you have affect your surgery options or success rate? 
specifically, what are the options for normal tension glaucoma patients? That is a great question too. So with the sink analogy, some types of glaucoma have blockage because the pipe that's plugged into your sink in your house is blocked. And some types of glaucoma have high pressure because the pipes that are going out of your kitchen, out of your house, down the street, all the way to the sewage treatment plant are blocked. And so you could imagine if you try to rotor rooter your sink, but the pipes are clogged down the street, then it's still not going to flow. But you could imagine if your sink is blocked because there's literally potato peels in your sink in your kitchen, then if you unclog that sink, it's going to work. So similar idea, some types of glaucoma involve blockage at the trabecular meshwork, like pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, pigmentary glaucoma. There's a few that involve your sink not working exactly right there. And if we cut that tissue and flush that tissue, it will work extremely well because that's exactly where the blockage is. There's other types of glaucoma, like primary open angle glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, and, and others, where there's blockages sort of downstream in the collector channels. And so then you could imagine if you just fixed the plumbing right in your kitchen, the blockages are still there farther downstream. And so you could do a angle procedure, like a MIGS procedure, and it may not work because the blockages are, are farther. And in those types of problems, then a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt would make more sense because you have to basically repipe your whole street. It's not just about changing out the pipes in your kitchen, but in this example, you would repipe everything between your house and the sewage treatment plant. And finally, there's types of glaucomas where the angle is blocked. So angle closure glaucomas that have scar tissue between your iris and your drain inside your eye. So in those kinds of glaucomas, we cannot reach the drain. We would have to pull off a lot of scar tissue to get there. And in some cases, you can't really remove the scar tissue or cut through the scar tissue to reach the natural drain. It's already been blocked by scar tissue. So in those cases, we would want to bypass it with a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt, for example. In normal tension glaucoma, the target pressure is much lower than many other types of glaucoma. And so the type of surgery that can get you the lowest pressures are trabeculectomy. And so if a patient has normal tension glaucoma, they may be more likely to be recommended something like that, as opposed to one of the minimally invasive procedures or even a tube shunt. But it depends. It depends on what your target is. What is the average recovery process like after surgery? And um, I want to open this question up to Ginny and Beta, and maybe you can speak to your experience with that. I'll just say really quickly, I only had one surgery and versus Beta, who had a lot more than I did. But after my surgery, I know I had to, um, you know, you just have to remember that there's a little bit of life, a change of your lifestyle. You have to just be a little bit more careful with the bending and actually how you sleep as well. I used to sleep flat on my black back and now I sleep with my head elevated because um, I know that helps with the interocular pressure. And um, I think even after I have surgery, you know, I, I have um, I have a severe loss of peripheral vision on my left side. So I have to, it's just a lifestyle change. I have to always make sure I look to my left constantly, no matter what I'm doing, walking, driving in the kitchen, because I'll knock something down and you just have to be, that's just like part of life for me. But um, after the surgery, it was just more like being more, a little bit more careful. Hi. Um, for myself, I would say that my recovery times were different based on what type of procedure I had. With the laser procedures that I had, I could go back to school or go back to work in one or two days. Um, there was one time I took two days off and could have gone back the next day if I had really had to. I experienced some scratchiness. Um, with my Ahmed Clear Path shunt surgery, the recovery from that was definitely just a little bit longer, particularly because my eye had been through so many surgeries in the past that the recovery time was you know, just going to be a little bit longer to begin with. Um, I would say it was about a week before my eye felt um, better in terms of light sensitivity, pain, scratchiness. Um, and I think 
one of the important things to remember is that you have just gone through a procedure, right? I, in the glaucoma support group that I co-moderate, um, it was actually founded by a woman in Denmark. Um, we see a lot of questions from patients asking, you know, it's the day after my surgery. Is it normal that my eye is red? And of course, if you're really concerned, you should reach out to your surgeon. But I think it's just so important to remember that your body is healing and it is going to take time. So, you know, try to be patient with yourself and allow your body that time to heal. That's a great point. I just sprained my ankle yesterday, so I definitely know what you mean. <laughs> um, so Dr. Q, does one type of surgery have a better recovery process than the other? In terms of better, the easiest one to recover from are those lasers that don't cut into the eye at all. <clears throat> those ones just really have no activity restrictions whatsoever. And so there are scenarios where that might be great, like if you're... Um, an active child, if you are a more elderly person and live in a nursing home, like there's just different examples where you might need a surgery where there are no activity restrictions and there is no infection risk. And then there are uh, the type of glaucoma surgery that's hardest to recover from would be a trabeculectomy or a tube shut. Those are the more involved ones that have more stitches on the outside, more, you know, pressure too low risk, more you have to sleep a different way, you can't lift. Um, those ones are definitely more involved. And then the, the MIGS procedures would fall in the middle, depending on which type of MIGS and how much of your drain we are treating. And some people really, because of their work, they just can't, they just can't have a certain type of procedure. I have a patient who is like a construction worker. And he said, if I take a week off surgery, I'm going to get fired. And, um, he couldn't have the tube because he couldn't take enough time off to have the tube. And so we did the minimally invasive procedure first. And even after that, when I say, really, you cannot lift for like, I said a week. Um, but he's like, I heal like a dog. I'm going to go back to work on Monday. And he did. And he was fine. But I was really worried about him, <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes I think maybe the surgeons are that we, we tell you all these restrictions because we want to be extremely careful. I wonder if sometimes we're going overboard with how restrictive we're telling you you have to be um, because we want to be safe and we don't want anything bad to happen, like you to have an infection or a bleed or, or something. But, you know, he actually was fine. He went back to work on Monday and he hasn't had any problems. Um, and so in that case, we made a decision based on his occupation uh, in terms of what procedure we could choose and what was really feasible for him because he could not risk losing his job. So someone in the chat box said, I had glaucoma surgery, but now my vision is no longer 2020. Is that common and is it permanent? Um, and again, Jenny and Beata, if you can comment on this, please. I'll just comment on mine. Yeah, I mean, I what would I think what concerned me most was when I discovered that with my glaucoma, the vision loss that I had won't come back. And that my decision to have this, which surgery I would choose would be the one that would preserve the vision that I had left. And so I'm not quite sure about um, this question, but I think that what I understand is that once we lose our vision in glaucoma, that part of the vision doesn't come back. But the, sur the surgeries are so... So um, how can I say so current now? And they're so, so, so delicate. And the surgeons are so knowledgeable that it brings me a lot of hope because I had, I think I had 80% vision loss in my left eye and um, she just preserved what I had. And I haven't lost any since because of the trabeculectomy that I had. So um, I think that what we lose, we lose, but we have to be hopeful to keep what we can keep, if that helps. It's amazing that your remaining vision was preserved, Jenny. Um, for myself, it is a little bit hard to say because I also had some periods of um, high pressure where my glaucoma was just not as well controlled. Um, and my glaucoma specialist has stated that most of my vision loss is probably from those high pressure spikes rather mm -hmm. than from any um, results of surgery. Um, after the Ahmed Clear Path shunt, I definitely experienced some blurriness for a little while, which has since settled down for the most part. Um, again, uh, piggybacking off of what Jenny said, I think that you know each glaucoma surgery or procedure is an opportunity to keep our sight. And I really like to look at it that way is that it's an opportunity. You know, I don't want to look back and say, 
I didn't try something to keep my vision for as long as I possibly could. And I think that's where the conversations with your specialist are so important to ask, you know, what are the next steps? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What should I look out for? Um, after I had my shunt surgery, I remember telling my glaucoma specialist a couple months later, I said, you know, the recovery from this was not easy the first couple of days, but I wish I would have listened to you sooner because the surgery was so successful for me and it kept my pressure at a much more stable place, which after all my eye has been through, I find truly incredible. Thank you for sharing. And um, I tell patients that your vision before surgery, if everything goes perfectly smoothly with the surgery, ideally would not be any worse than where you are you know, now the goal is to protect every little bit that you have. However, when you go through a surgery, there are risks too, like pressure spikes, for example. And so you might lose a little bit of ground in the process of having surgery for the long-term benefit of that pressure control. And uh, the analogy that I heard a more senior glaucoma specialist tell a group of glau young glaucoma specialists once was that <clears throat> he likes to tell his patients that glaucoma patients are like a herd of zebras in a field and you've eaten all the grass and there's no grass left. And so if you all just stay in this field, you're all starved to death. And so you can't just stay there. And so that would be like a, a lot of glaucoma patients who all have high pressure. And if you just did nothing, you're, you're, you're gonna lose all your sight from the high pressure. So you have to migrate. And so this herd of zebras has to get to the greener pastures on the other side, which is like the low pressure. And in order to get there, you have to cross the river and in the river, there are crocodiles. And if a hundred zebras cross a river, like one of them might be eaten by the crocodile. And, um, you know, sometimes there are surgical complications. Sometimes despite everything going pretty smoothly, you still end up with slightly blurrier vision than you had before. Sometimes the pressure is too low and that can give you blurry vision too. Sometimes that's reversible and sometimes it's irreversible. But, you know, to get 99 out of hundred zebras to the other side safely, Sometimes one zebra is gonna get eaten by the crocodile. And when it's time to have your surgery, you and your surgeon have to really feel like, I mean, okay, we have to do something. Otherwise we're all gonna to starve to death. You have to feel like every other less invasive option was tried, all the other alternatives were tried. And that when you kind of take the plunge into the river to cross to the greener pastures, um, that that's the right thing because that's really, there's no other good choice. And if God forbid you suffer a complication, which could happen to any of you, um, you just knew that everybody tried their best and you all tried to cross that river together and the crocodile just kind of got you this time. Um, so I really like that analogy. I thought that was a great way of putting it. Um, there's, you know, I, I'm so happy that your surgeries are working well for you and there's going to be like one in a hundred or somebody who had a surgery and just straight up had a problem, like a complication after surgery. And then they got worse vision and it could happen like a retinal detachment or something like a very bad infection or something. It could happen. Um, and you just have to know that if it happened to you, like everyone was just trying to save your vision. And if you hadn't had the surgery, you would have lost your vision too. Thank you for the analogy. That was very um, visual. Um, so another question we received is, does surgery eliminate drops, eye drops altogether? What were your two experiences? My personal experience was, uh, yes, my left eye, my, my right eye is 100%. I don't have glaucoma in my right eye. I only have it in my left eye. And um, I my pressure right now is around seven. And I don't take any drops for my left eye. So yeah, the drops weren't helping. I could put so many drops and it would never lower the pressure. And um, I had thought about doing the MIGS as well, some of the other minimal invasive. But after I did a lot of research and I went through all of different um, scenarios, I decided just to do the trabeculectomy because that was for sure the best option for me. So I don't have any drops right now. That is incredible. Um, for myself, I was able to reduce the number of drops I was on, which was the greatest blessing to me um, because I was on a lot of medications in addition, um, and by medications, I mean eye drops, in addition to an oral medication called Diamox or acetazolamide to control my glaucoma last winter. And I was able to come off the majority of those medications. So currently in the eye that I had surgery in, I only take one drop twice a day which is a huge decrease from what I was taking. Um, and I'm sure that um, Dr. Q can speak much better to this, but 
I think that glaucoma, like many other things in life, is extremely individual. So one person's experience can't necessarily be yeah. um, assigned to you know, another person's. So one person may never need to take an, um, an eye drop again, and one person may still need eye drops, but maybe um, those number of drops can be reduced. You guys hit the nail on the head, so I barely have to say anything, but that's right. <laughs> Trabeculectomy has the biggest sort of success rate when it works successfully because it has the potential to lower your pressure the most. Um, so a successful trabeculectomy that's fully flowing, it is quite possible to be, to be totally off drops. And you did say for now, which is the right you know mindset because it could you could always get into a position in the future where you might need a drop where the pressure will creep up and then maybe you have to add something back. And then you, uh, you had the experience of your eye drops and your oral medication being reduced. And that is also a great outcome. You know, oftentimes people are on five different eye drops plus a pill and the pressure is too high at that. And so I actually usually, uh, I set the expectation pretty low. I say, we're just trying to make your pressure lower and you might still have to take all these medications. And um, if we can achieve a pressure that's under control without reducing any medications, assuming you tolerate the medications, that's already a success. And for some other people, they cannot tolerate the medications. They're having a lot of side effects with Diamox or a lot of the eye drops are causing an allergy or ocular surface problems. And then part of the reason to do the surgery is because we must eliminate the medications. And so for those patients, we're aiming for you know a lower pressure under control with fewer medications the end of the day, we want your pressure to be under control on as, as few medications as it takes to keep it there. And we're aiming to choose medications that you're not allergic to or have bad reactions to. So you're, you're totally right. It's very patient specific. Some people just like heal more or heal less or have more or less bleeding or whatever it may be. So there's really no great way to predict whether or not you're going to be off all glaucoma eye drops after surgery. But I would, ex I would expect that you might still have to take drops at some point in your life because I think that's a realistic expectation. Um, but then you can just be extremely happy if you were off all of them, even for a little while. Thank you. Is dry eye a common side effect following surgery? And if so, can it be permanent or can it expect to get resolved eventually? You guys go first. Dry eye for me go is ahead. constant. Oh, go ahead, sorry. So, no, 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 go ahead. I just for me, dry eyes is are my dry eyes are constant. They're always dry. So no matter I just put those the the eye drops in constantly. And if it gets really bad, I'll put warm compresses on my eyes. And that seems to help as well. But they get itchy at times. How about you? Those warm compresses are the best sometimes. Um, I've definitely experienced increased dry eye. The first time I experienced it, I had no idea what was going on. I thought that something was really wrong. I went to the eye doctor and I was told your eyes are just very dry. Um, so I use lubricating drops as well because of the amount I use. I opt for the preservative free vials and I love those. I carry them everywhere I go. Um, dry eye for myself at least also tends to be made worse by the current weather that we're having you know, winter, um, snow, cold, all of those things. Um, so I use a humidifier as well in the winter. Mm. Um, it is definitely a side effect, I think, that I've experienced from some of my surgeries. But um, in terms of the pressure lowering I've experienced, I would say it's worth it. My eyes are really dry at baseline, and I haven't even had glaucoma surgery. So I can only <laughs> imagine how dry my eyes would feel after the surgeries you guys have had. Um, some surgeries do cause dry eye in like a more permanent way, like those lasers that I mentioned, the ones that go on the outside of your eye, sometimes those lasers can also sort of laser the areas of your eye that are responsible for keeping it moist. And so sometimes after those lasers, like your eye just ends up more dry, like period. Sometimes after the trabeculectomy and the tube shunt, your eye can feel more dry because there's been cutting on the surface. Um, there's stitches on the surface. And so that's going to affect how your eye feels. And some of the post-operative eye drops that we give you make your eyes really dry. Sometimes there's a gray cap called Ketorolac, which stings going in and makes your eyes super dry. The steroid drops that you're on afterwards, those can make your eyes super dry. So sometimes the treatments we give you are kind of worsening the dryness as well. And some of the glaucoma eye drops will make your eyes more dry because they're so irritating. So I agree with the preservative-free artificial tears. Those are everyone's best friend. 
um, carry them around all the time. I have them on my nightstand too. I just wake up with dry eyes every day. And so it's um, safe to use as much preservative-free artificial tears as you want. Um, so that can help offset some of the dry sensation. But again, it's, it is totally worth it if we can achieve control of your pressure. Thank you all. Um, who qualifies for glaucoma surgery and when is it necessary? Well, glaucoma surgery is necessary if your pressure is too high for your eyeball because we know that your eyeball is getting worse. So that pressure number is different for different people. Um, a lot of times people will ask like, what's a normal pressure? What pressure do I need? And sometimes we know the answer to that. And sometimes we don't really know, like your pressure might seem like it's pretty high, but is it too high for you? Like sometimes we don't know until we wait and watch over time. And then if we see, oh my gosh, you've lost a little bit more vision compared to last year, then we know, okay, you definitely need surgery. Sometimes we know the pressure is so high that if we didn't do surgery, we could be sure that you would lose more vision. So then we would do surgery, even though you haven't worsened yet, we don't want you to worsen. Um, I mean, pretty much everybody is a candidate for some type of glaucoma surgery if you need it. Um, if your pressure is very high, but you have no vision in that eye, well, then we would not necessarily do a surgery um, unless that eye were having pain, in which case we would do a procedure to lower the pain. And in those cases, we would not do any incisional surgeries because we wouldn't want to risk any kind of infection in an eye that does not see. So in those cases, we would do those lasers that don't actually cut on the eye. They're just lasers from the outside. Um, I mean, I could imagine certain types of procedures are kind of contraindicated in certain types of patients. Like if you um, do martial arts, then probably you shouldn't have a trabeculectomy. Like you said, you have to be so careful after surgery in terms of your precautions. You know, if you were like a professional boxer, you know, we might choose like a MIGS procedure first because some of some, some certain uh, physical activities um, are just not possible if you have had certain types of surgeries. There is a little bit more risk um, of contact lens wear if you've had a trabeculectomy compared to a tube. And so sometimes people who, do you wear contacts by the way? For me? Yeah. Me, no, I don't. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, because after a trabeculectomy, sometimes contact lenses can increase your risk of um, an infection. So sometimes people will say, well, I, you know, need my contact lenses. I can't do without them. Then we might say, well, maybe a trabeculectomy you're not really a good candidate for. Maybe a tube shunt would be better. Um, so, you know, things like that. Thank you. Um, so we got a question here in the chat that says, how do you decide if one doctor says surgery and then you get another opinion from a different doctor saying that surgery isn't necessary? And um, Jenny, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience because from the patient summit, we know that you saw about five different doctors before you decided on your trabeculectomy. Yeah, you're right. I really did because um, one doctor I, and all the doctors that I, I saw, I know they want the best for me and for my eyesight. It was really my decision. Um, and um, one had suggested a trabectomy. And after I did research, he couldn't guarantee that my pressure would be low enough to uh, maintain the eyesight that I had. One had, su had suggested um, laser and also, I, he couldn't guarantee. He'd say, well, let's see how your pressure does after that. And so, and then I saw a different specialist and the other one thought, well, let's just wait with drops and see how that goes. But in my case, I didn't have time to wait to see if, oh, if the laser works or if the trabectomy works. I didn't have time because I didn't have, an, uh, my eyesight was so, the loss of my eyesight was so severe that I didn't, ha I didn't feel like I had that time to waste. I had to decide on the best option that would for sure make my pressure low enough to maintain the vision that I have to preserve it. And so after I saw um, my Dr. Bedrood, she had suggested a trabeculectomy. I did research and she said she could guarantee low pressure and would um, really, she could preserve the eyesight that I had left. And so I went with the, the more, I guess you could say the more invasive, um, the trabeculectomy, but, and that's why I chose that because I didn't have time to decide like what was, um, what was best for me. I had, didn't have time to wait to see if one was going to work or the other. I just had to go with the sure 
the sure one that for sure would work for me. So that's what made me take my decision. Did that help? Definitely. Thank you for sharing. Uh -huh. How about you? Um, for myself, I only have had one glaucoma specialist for the past oh, at least 12 years. So she's been sticking with me for a long time. Um, and she was actually going to recommend a goniotomy, goniotomy, I believe, for me. Um, and then my pressure increased. And she said that going to a shunt would make more sense because it had the potential for increased um, possibility of lowering my pressure as opposed to that other procedure. Um, and she did tell me that just because of my past surgical history, this shunt may come with a few more risks than the goniotomy, but it would also have a um, potential for a better outcome and more pressure reduction. Um, and as my pressure got higher, she, you know, told me we really need to move forward with this. Um, and I, I really trust my glaucoma specialist just because she always seems to have something else up her sleeve when my eye is not <laughs> behaving itself. So I went with, um, with the shunt. So there are many different treatment algorithms that people can have for glaucoma. And so a lot, some of it is surgeon dependent, like some surgeons do more trabeculectomy and some surgeons do more shunts and some surgeons do more MIGs and some surgeons do a combination of these procedures, but not all of them. Some surgeons do all of them. It, so sometimes when you see multiple people to get different opinions, um, the person you're talking to may or may not have all the procedures up their sleeves. And so sometimes certain procedure works better in one person's hands than another. Like if you're gonna have a trabeculectomy, you wanna have it with somebody who is very familiar with trabeculectomy and does a ton of them. But if you were to go to a different surgeon who does not do a lot of trabeculectomy and they do a lot of tubes, then maybe in their hands, a tube would work better because they're more mm. experienced with that. So there's a little bit of like, a you know, what is the best surgery like in a vacuum, but there's also a, what type of surgery does this surgeon do the most? And so if you're going to choose a procedure, you may want to choose a surgeon who does that procedure a lot, which seems obvious, but I mean, I'll say it specifically as well. Um, and so sometimes there's no right answer, like procedure A versus B, both have good evidence that they could work. And in one person's hands or in one patient's body, it will behave differently. Um, and so, and also you had a good point, which was some people said you could start with the small procedure before moving on to the big procedure. And some, somebody else said, let's just go straight to the big procedure because that was going to have a biggest, the biggest effect in terms of controlling your pressure. And I like to try to present all the options too. Sometimes I'll say, well, one option is we could start with a small procedure, but you got to know that if it doesn't work, then we're going to do the big procedure. But if you don't want to have two procedures because you don't like the sound of um, the chance that the first one may not work, we can go straight to the big procedure and that will give you a higher chance of the one procedure working the most, but then you've had a bigger procedure from the beginning. And then some patients, like they just have a gut feeling about it and they'll say, oh my God, well, I, I don't want to have the more invasive thing if I could try the smaller thing. And some people will say, oh my gosh, I don't want to have two things. Just give me the big thing right away. <laughs> and some, and like, I don't know, you know, each individual and how they might make decisions um, about things in their life. You know, sometimes people like the stepwise approach. Sometimes people like to go big or go home. And unless I know the person very well, like over 12 years, um, you know, sometimes I'm only meeting you for the first time and you just had glaucoma for the first time and um, you never had it before. And this is my first time meeting you. So I can't really guess what approach you're going to prefer. So sometimes I give you a choice. Sometimes I kind of lean the way that I might lean, or I might say this, if this were my dad, I would recommend this. Um, but there's sometimes no right, right or wrong answer. And then it might just be a matter of which surgeon you vibe with and what, you know, thing they're saying kind of makes sense to you in your heart. And then you just got to trust your surgeon and go with it. Yeah. That's a great point about vibing with your surgeon. I think that has a lot to do with how confident you'll feel in them. Um, so for a child with tube shunt, what is the expected length of time the tubes will remain successful in keeping pressures down? Um, and then it's a two part. Will the effects um, affect the child's lifestyle and can they eventually be removed? Well, you had a tube shunt as a child, right? 
Um, I had a few, I had a tube shunt placed when I was a teen that just for whatever reason did not end up working out. Um, so I no longer have that one, but I have the Ahmed clear path that was just placed, um, earlier this year. So that was definitely placed as an adult. And were those, was it exchanged? Like, did you have one surgery to remove one tube and put in another tube? No, the, um, the first one was removed. I want to say when I was 16. So, um, for whatever reason, my eye just did not, um, did not really accept that tube at that time. Um, and the glaucoma specialist that I have now used, um, just a combination of different tools throughout the surgery that I'm sure she could explain much better than I can, including putting a scleral patch graft over the tube. Um, so it's just worked wonderfully for me. Um, and I don't have any restrictions currently. I certainly did for at least a few weeks after my surgery, um, you know, no bending, no lifting heavy items, um, no immersing your head in water, being very careful when you're taking a shower, um, things like that. But now I currently have no restrictions at all. Um, I run, I walk, I work full time, you know, I, I don't have any restrictions as far as that goes. So the tube was extremely successful. Definitely. I agree with that. So kids that get tubes when they're young because of glaucoma in childhood, once they're fully recovered from the surgery, should be able to be pretty normal with the exception of something literally like boxing. Like you just don't want to be getting hit in the face. Um, so just be careful with hobbies that might involve, you know, trauma to that to the face. Um, sometimes tubes need to be revised or removed or repositioned or exchanged or something like that. And so that can happen in the future for your whole life. I mean, cause now you have a piece of hardware that's in your eye socket. And so of course anything could happen to any hardware that's in there. And, um, sometimes tubes, um, don't work at first and then they can be revised and they work better. Or sometimes a different type of tube can be used instead. And that works a little bit better. And there's constantly research out there on the horizon. Scientists and engineers are trying to develop you know, newer types of tubes, better types of tubes, tubes that have less risks, tubes that heal better, things that scar less. And so just even in the next several decades, I'm sure there's going to be so much technology that doesn't even exist right now. That's very positive. Um, are you still a candidate for surgery if you have macular degeneration? Yes. Oh. <laughs> it just depends on the vision. Um, if you have macular degeneration and your vision is not normal, but it's still decent, then that's vision that you want to preserve. And so if you have macular degeneration and glaucoma, then you can have a number of different of these glaucoma options to help preserve your vision as it relates to the glaucoma. Even if your pressure is under control, though, that does not you know, change the fact that you also have macular degeneration. So you may still lose vision related to the macular degeneration separately from the glaucoma, even if your pressure is under control. Some types of macular degeneration, like the wet type, involve getting shots in your eye. And so sometimes if you have to have frequent shots in your eye, this can affect your glaucoma surgery. Um, theoretically, when you have these repeated shots in the eye, you know, that might make your surgery fail or get infected or, you know, something like that. If you've had one of the previous MIGS procedures, um, especially one that like cuts into the drain the whole way, like a big goniotomy, sometimes like a shot in the eye with a big needle can make that bleed, for example. So sometimes these things can interact with each other. But yes, broadly, yes, like just because you have one type of eye disease doesn't mean that you can't be treated also for glaucoma. It's just that your doctor has to know about the other diseases you have in your eyes and then help recommend what types of glaucoma surgeries you are or are not a candidate for. And your vision uh, prognosis is going to depend on two things instead of just one or multiple things. Thank you for that. What are the options for someone with both cataracts and glaucoma? That's a great question. So cataract surgery normally just involves removing your cataract and putting in a clear lens. The MIGS procedures were first kind of developed to be done at the time of cataract surgery. So that would be cataract plus eye stent, cataract plus hydrus, cataract plus goniotomy, cataract plus canaloplasty, cataract plus then, um, cataract plus trabeculectomy, cataract plus tube shunt, cataract plus ECP. So pretty much all of them, depending on um, the type of glaucoma you have, whether your angle is open or closed, whether you have any other eye diseases, what previous glaucoma surgeries you've had, um, et cetera. The two 
lasers that don't cut into your eye, like the CPC and the micropulse CPC, you wouldn't necessarily want to have that at the time of cataract surgery, because those lasers, the benefit is that you don't have to have a cut on your eye. So if you're already needing to have cataract surgery, then you may want to combine it with a procedure that, you know, also involves cutting on your eye because you're already having incisional surgery. Um, if you were to have cataract surgery at the time of one of the other glaucoma surgeries, you know, sometimes the cataract part goes first, sometimes the glaucoma part goes first, it doesn't really matter. And then um, in terms of the tubes, the tubes that get plugged into your eye can get plugged into one of three different spaces in your eye. And so if you've had cataract surgery at the time of your tube or, you know, in the past, that can impact where the new tube can go. Thank you. We have just a few more questions. If my IOP is stable on drops, should I consider surgery? If your IOP is stable on drops and your visual field is stable with your stable IOP and you have no adverse reaction to your drops and you don't need cataract surgery anyway, then perhaps you do not need surgery. So if your IOP is stable on drops, but you might be having pressure spikes when we're not checking it in the office, and it turns out your glaucoma is actually getting worse, even though your IOP seems to be stable, well, then you might need surgery to blunt those spikes because you might be progressing every time your pressure shoots up, maybe in the evening or something when you're not at the doctor's office. Um, if your IOP is stable on drops and you've done a, like a eye care home when you've checked your IOP and it's always the same number like 24 seven and you're progressing, well, that means your IOP is um, not low enough. So then you, you should have surgery to lower the pressure. Sometimes your IOP is stable on drops and you're just having severe reactions to all your medications. So then you might be having a surgery purely to get off some medications with the goal of achieving the same IOP. Sometimes your IOP is stable on drops and you just happen to need a cataract surgery. So then you could just throw in a mini glaucoma procedure, just pick the least invasive one, and then you're adding minimal extra risk for the additional benefit of maybe getting off an extra drop or two. And I will also mention that cataract surgery by itself does lower the pressure by a point or two. So sometimes just regular cataract surgery by itself lowers the pressure enough that you might be able to get off one drop or something like that. Um, okay, I think those are all the hypothetical scenarios I listed. Thank you for that. What What's next if one surgery doesn't lower IOP? Well, it depends on what the first surgery is. And then um, some surgeries make more sense in one order and then the next. So like usually, you know, you would do maybe a MIGS first and then a big surgery, but sometimes you had the big surgery first and that fails and you can actually go back and do a MIGS. Sometimes, usually you would have a trabeculectomy before a tube for de depending on the type of glaucoma you have. But then sometimes you have a tube first and if that fails and if there's space on your eye, you can still have a trabeculectomy later. And so um, sometimes you might have a non-incisional laser as the first line because you really do not want to have a surgery that involves cutting on your eye. Um, but sometimes you had an incisional surgery first and that's failed and now you want to go back and do something more and you don't want incisional surgery like more of it. So then you have the non-incisional laser. And so your surgeon will tell you what options are available as the next step and why the ones that are not available are not available. And so you should definitely ask your surgeon, you know, my one surgery has failed. What are my options? And um, one good question you can ask your surgeon is actually, are there any other procedures that might be an option for me that you just don't personally perform, but might be a good option for me? Because then they might say, oh yes, there's this other one and I just don't happen to do it, but I'll refer you to a colleague in town. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm not sure if everybody would necessarily like volunteer that. They might just say, oh, well, these, this is what I would do next and because that's just the procedures they do the most. But maybe, you know, you have heard about something online that is an option and your surgeon didn't mention it. It might just be that they don't predict, they don't happen to do that one. And if that one sounds like one you want to learn more about, then you could just ask, you know, is there somebody else that I could get another opinion from to learn more about that particular procedure? And usually no one will be offended about that. Not everyone does every single type of surgery. There are so many options. Thank you so much. Beita, as we wrap up, can you please share a little bit about your online support group that you moderate? We received a ton of questions, so we want to make sure we cover that. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so the group was founded by a woman named Nia who lives in Denmark, um, I want to say over 10 years ago. Um, and she had a goal of providing um, online support to glaucoma patients worldwide, allowing them a place to connect, share experiences, um, 
and, you know, just kind of have someone to commiserate with sometimes. Sometimes you just want to talk to someone who gets it and has been through um, a similar walk. So the group is open to glaucoma patients. Um, individuals who maybe have a loved one with glaucoma, care for someone with glaucoma are also welcome in the group. Medical professionals are welcome in the group, but it really is patient centered on patient experiences. Um, and I co-moderate it with a few other administrators. So if you search um, like glaucoma eyes, it should come up for you. We have over 20,000 members from around the world, and it's really just a great space to seek support, offer support, and talk about our experiences. Um, so please feel free to, to join the group. Thank you, Dr. Mary Q, Beta, and Ginny. Um, for spending some time with us today and for providing such great information to glaucoma patients, family members, and friends. And thank you to our participants for your interest and support. If we were unable to answer your questions today, please visit our website, www.glaucoma.org, for the latest information about glaucoma and our research. And please don't forget to mark your calendars for June 28th and June 29th, 2024 for our sixth annual patient summit in Philadelphia. You can go to www.glaucoma.org slash summit for more information. Thank you once again for being here with us. See you next time. Mm -hmm.